Today, I would like to talk about jazz rock fusion. It's a style of music in the history of jazz that really encompasses a period from the mid 60s to probably the early part of the 1970s. And really what it is, it's jazz musicians, especially younger jazz musicians, bringing to the table the kinds of music that they heard growing up. In other words, most of the important musicians in this uh, movement were born in the mid-1940s. So they grew up in the 50s hearing rock music. They're not um, children of the big band era, so their ears are, are slightly different um, in terms of the kind of music that they're, they're familiar with and, and the sounds that they grew up with. So let's start in 1966. In 1966, Miles Davis was um, still at the top of his game, he had a great quintet, known as a second grade quintet, and he surrounded himself with younger musicians. This time, Miles was 36 years old, and he surrounded himself with musicians who were in their early to mid 20s. The drummer was quite young, he wasn't even 20 yet, and uh, they were more amenable to hearing new sounds and incorporating them in the, in the traditional sense of, of hard bop and bebop and cool jazz. So enough talking. So in 1966, Miles Davis recorded a fabulous album called Miles Smiles. And there's one track on it in particular. It's called Freedom Jazz Dance. That's a departure from the other tracks. Now we're gonna listen to oh, about 30 to 40 seconds of it. And I pay particular attention to the way this young drummer, Tony Williams is playing the hi-hat. In traditional jazz swing, the hi-hat is on two and four, one, two. A one, two, three, four. But in rock music that starts to develop in the early 60s, the hi-hat is moving on all four beats in the measure, and it forces the music to have kind of a different kind of rhythmic feel. The bass player, Ron Carter, is not playing walking basses, bass lines. He's playing a kind of a, a modified funk a bass line that you might hear from the James Brown rhythm section. So pay particular attention to it. The improvisation is pure Miles Davis, but the rhythm section approach is very different. Check this out. <laughs> Nineteen sixty-six was a very important year in this development of this new branch on the jazz tree that we call jazz rock or jazz rock fusion. You know, jazz is the original fusion, so it doesn't. It's not surprising that it would just fuse so easily with different kinds of music. And of course, rock comes from the same wellspring as jazz, so they're like they're re they're relatives. And it's like when you go to a wedding, you see relatives you haven't seen in a while. You kind of you know um, you know catch up on how things are going. And so this is jazz kind of reintroducing itself to its younger relatives, kind of in a, in a circular matter. 1966. So we already talked about Miles. We're going to come back to him um, um, later. But 1966, the most popular jazz group in, in all of the United States was led by a man by the name of Charles Lloyd. And um, he had a quartet that was um, playing music that was 
sounding more modern. In fact, they were playing at venues like Fillmore East and Fillmore West, traditional rock venues. The musicians were very young and, and uh, Charles Lloyd played saxophone and flute. And the music had this kind of energetic um, approach that you heard from rock bands from the period, whether it was uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix or The Doors or um, The Blues Project or stuff that Al Cooper was doing. And those rock musicians were all very familiar with jazz because they kind of grew up around it. But Charles Lloyd, was able to reach a younger demographic. And he's still around today playing, he's in his 80s, but some of those records that he played, that he recorded way back then, really were um, seminal and important in the establishment of this new style. So we're gonna check out a 1966 album. Um, it's, the name of the album is Forest Flower. This piece is called Sorcery. Now they would come out wearing, you know, tie-dye shirts, uh, dashikis, you know, very modern, not your typical jazz garb that you would see in the 50s. And it really caught on with young people. This was the most popular group, jazz group in 1966. Charles Lloyd. in the year 1966, there was a group of young jazz musicians who were really um, well aware of what was going on the rock scene in the mid-60s in New York, and they called the name of their group the Free Spirits, and it's really probably one of the first true jazz rock groups. Um, it was led by a great young guitarist by the name of Larry Coriel, a great drummer by the name of Bob Moses. Larry and Bob would go on to play with some, some important musicians in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and a great um, young uh, saxophonist by the name of Jim Pepper. They call themselves the Free Spirits, and they were incorporating rock music um, with jazz. They were great improvisers, but the rhythm really sounds more like what you might hear on AM radio circa 1965 or 1966, music from maybe the British invasion. Musical invasion, that is. Um, and uh, it was a very good instrumental band, but the record company they were with um, insisted that they incorporate vocals. It really wasn't a vocally oriented group. And so we're gonna hear a piece called um, Don't Look Now. And the vocals, they, they're not great. Um, but the music, the musicianship is really important and is really great because it's really one of the first successful fusions of rock music with jazz. This is Free Spirits, Don't Look Now. So check this out. This is really interesting. Check me out, I'm sailing on a muddy stream of consciousness. Well, I guess I must be failing to circumvent my circumstances. Rocks on Staten Island, the story of the people. That the stones could be lying to me, it's simply inconceivable. In 1966, again, uh, Larry Coriel and Bob Moses, who out were playing with Free Spirits, did some live um, uh, recordings, and you can, you can find them um, on bootlegs that are available now, and the band was really, really great. But the band broke up, and um, at that time, there was a great jazz vibraphonist by the name of Gary Burton, who was on the scene. And uh, Gary and Larry Coriel and Bob Moses formed a group. Uh, they added a bass player, and they did a record in 1967 that was really a great fusion of jazz and rock music. Um, the name of the album is called Lofty Fake Anagram. The name of the song is June 15th, 1967. That's a mouthful. But this is a fabulous um, recording. Um, now, Gary Burton playing with vibraphones has kind of a metallic sound. Um, was from the Midwest, so there's kind of almost a kind of a country hoedown feel mixed with rock music, and of course Larry Coriel's um, jazz guitar, rock playing, you know, um, rock and roll jazz slash jazz um, guitar playing is really fantastic. You have to remember that the most important rock guitar players of guitar player of this period was Jimi Hendrix, who really helped to alter the sound 
of the guitar. Of course, the technique was great, but he was really a pioneer in changing the function and the sound of the guitar. So let's check out this wonderful recording of Gary Burton with Larry Coryell from 1967. By 1968 and 1969, Miles Davis's second great quintet began to break up. Miles was looking in new directions. He was um, also trying to make his music relevant and make it accessible to younger people. He had, um, I believe he was dating a younger woman who was taking him to discotheques to hear um, Sly and the Family Stone, to hear Jimi Hendrix. And Miles, you know, is the great observer. So he's seeing that the cha there are changes in popular music and he wants to keep his music relevant and fresh. And the musicians who've been playing with him for a few years, you know, he kept them with him. But Miles began to use a pool of musicians and he discovered this great young guitarist from England. His name was John McLaughlin. And John John is really one of the first true jazz rock guitarists. He had great technique. He could play in the tradition of West Montgomery, but he could also utilize the sound of Jimi Hendrix. So this was really a, kind of a, a pioneering style of jazz rock guitar playing. And we're going to um, talk about McLaughlin in, in a number of um, records that he made throughout the 70s and 80s because he was a fantastic um, uh, guitarist. So back to Miles Davis. In 1969, He's thinking not about songs, you know, traditionally constructed songs. He is branching out. He's listening to, um, you know, pop music, rock music, and he sees the world changing about him. He changes his, his outfits. He was always a very sharp dresser, and he's, he kind of got rid of the two-piece or three-piece suits for um, kind of flowing garb. Um, the musicians he was working with, most of them stayed with him, but again, it was a pool of musicians. He would use maybe two or three drummers, a guitarist, a couple of keyboard players. So the band began to splinter, but the music really changed. Uh, Miles was very interested in fusing jazz with rock music and other approaches. And he did a record in 1969 called In a Silent Way, which was a real change for him. Um, music up to that point was more or less acoustic. He wasn't using guitar or electronic instruments. You hear him trying it in 1968 um, by using, utilizing a guitarist. He used two um, very good jazz guitarists, but they weren't rock guitars. He needed that sound, that, that cutting edge sound. So this record called In a Silent Way is actually jam sessions recorded in the studio that after the recordings were made, the musicians would leave. The producer um, and engineer, Tio Macera, would, would cut and paste these recordings together. And this was a great departure for Miles Davis. A lot of young people liked it. Um, the people who liked his music in the 50s didn't understand it, but In a Silent Way is one of the great jazz rock experiments. We're gonna listen to, um, it's a long recording. It's about four, about 18 minutes long. We're gonna pick it up somewhere about five or six minutes, and you're gonna hear you know, pure heavy metal rock mixed with jazz in this. In a Silent Way, Miles Davis, 1969. By 1970, Miles Davis had replaced the members of that second great quintet. A young pianist by the name of Chick Corea had joined the group. Uh, John McLaughlin was playing on and off with him, the great guitarist. Um, he was using a couple of different drummers and a couple of horn players and using electric bass. Um, 
and the music was really changing. In 19, 1970, he released a double album on Columbia Records. Um, and there might have been some um, pressure from the record company to, for, for, for selling records. And, you know, the music business is a business and it's about selling recordings. And um, so Miles went along with it. And, and I've heard a number of different stories that he was resistant, that he wanted to do it. But nevertheless, this double album called Bitches Brew really was an incredible departure for Miles Davis. And arguably, Miles Davis was probably the most famous jazz musician on the planet in 1970. And for him to move away from the tradition of Charlie Parker, cool jazz, hard bop, even modal jazz from the late 50s and early 60s, to a purely electronic rock-oriented rhythm section and, and, and that kind of instrumentation really confused a lot of people. And I have to tell you that when I heard um, tracks from this album, I, I didn't like it. I, I wanted the old Miles Davis, but Miles Davis was never one to stay in one particular style. He was always moving on, looking for the next thing. I call him, again, the great observer, and it was time for him to move on. He called this not a jazz album. He called it Directions in Music by Miles Davis. We're going to listen to an excerpt from Miles Runs the Voodoo Down. Again, it's going to feature the great jazz guitarist, jazz rock guitarist John McLaughlin, and a pool of amazing musicians. Miles Runs a Voodoo Down, recorded in 1970. <laughs> drummer, Tony Williams, who had joined Miles in 1963, and he was 17 years old at the time, was a volcano behind the drum set. He really changed the way drummers played, he, he, and he was so young, and for someone of that a young age to just have such an incredible impact on jazz drumming in the 60s is really amazing. But by the late 60s, Tony was moving in his own direction. Miles was going this way. Now, Tony left Miles in 1969. He still collaborated with him through, the, I believe, the early 1970s. But in 1969, Tony formed a trio with the great jazz rock guitarist, John McLaughlin, and this amazing um, organist by the name of uh, Larry Young. And he called the group the Tony Williams Lifetime. And it was a really hard-edged group. I mean, in terms of the sound, it um, predates, I guess you would call maybe he almost heavy metal because of the, the vo sheer volume and the cutting edge of the sound. It was just guitar, drums, and organ. We're going to listen to the title track of uh, Tony's 1969 album, Emergency. Check this out. 